Hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to the broadcast. My name is Dr. Brad Reedy. This is Evoke Therapy Program's Finding You broadcast. And this is one of my favorite topics tonight. I'm going to talk about what to look for in a therapist and what to get out of therapy. And I'm going to do my very best to try to generalize it. So I'm not just picking out one particular approach, but really talking about the, the, the foundation of psychotherapy as I see it. What, 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 what has to go into the thinking and, and the relationship and the interaction between the therapist and the client, no matter what the, the modality is or the intervention or the technique might be. So that's what I'm going to be talking about tonight. One of the things that I like to do in this process, I do it with our, our, our clients in the wilderness. I do it with our therapists. I love to empower clients to have the experience of knowing what good therapy is so they can, they can measure it against their therapist. And I'll talk about that as we go along. Before I jump into the content and get heavy into it, I want to make this announcement again that we have a new offering, something brand new that we've never done before. I'm going to be hosting a, a conscious parenting workshop on November 4th from 9.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Mountain Time. There will be a, an hour for break, but aside from that, we're going to be participating in a dialogue, in a class. I'll be doing some lecturing, but it's going to be very interactive. You're going to be up on video. So if you want to participate in a class where there's a lot of back and forth, where we can go through some exercises and role plays, and I can really personalize the content to you and to your family, this is something for you to join. If you want to find more uh, out about this, contact intensives at evoketherapy.com or call our phone number at 866-411-6600. You can also go to our website and check us out there. Now for tonight's broadcast. I want to start off with this post that was just posted today. I wasn't necessarily thinking about it in terms of the broadcast. In fact, last week I was supposed to do this broadcast on Thursday and I had an injury in my neck. I had a pinched nerve that came out of nowhere and I was unable to sit up straight. So I had to cancel last minute and I apologize for that. But tonight I want to talk about something that is my passion. This post came up for me today and, and, I, and I shared it on my social media. I wrote, I have one piece of advice for therapy students new therapists, or even for ex experienced therapists. Go to therapy for at least five years. And I want to be clear about this. I have never met a great therapist who hasn't done a lot of their own work. Not one. I go on to write and say, forgive the double negative from the post, but the, the therapy at Evoke, the therapy that I practice is based on and, and requires a therapist to do their own work. Dr. Jamie Gill said in her brand new book, Doing Psychotherapy, a Primer, she said the therapist the, in his or, her own, his or her own psychotherapy learns firsthand the complexity of human development and what can go right or, or wrong with it. Often therapists learn as much or more during their own psychotherapy than they learn in school. I, I don't even understand, frankly, how somebody can take people to a place that they haven't been. I, I used to say to one of my close friends years ago, you have to involve yourself in therapy when you're practicing therapy because at the, in the least, very, very similar to when I encourage parents to, to attend 12-step uh, support groups or other classes, it's important to understand what it feels like to be the client, the, 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 the vulnerability and the risk of, of telling the truth about yourself and the risk being that the person on the other side of the equation may very well react like those in your background, your parents or, or others. So from the start, this work, attachment-based therapy, psychodynamic therapy, this work is based on the therapist's practice. And they can only take you to a very clear, in, in a very clear way, they can only take you as far as they've come in the process. And I'm going to talk about more of the characteristics of a therapist and what to look for, what you can ask for, what happens when it goes sideways, what happens when you're not getting what you, what you want, what happens when you come with a specific request or a need and the therapist may or may not practice that type of therapy. From the foreword of the book, The Audacity of You, my, my book, Dr. J.D. Gill, who is also my therapist, wrote this. She wrote, what does a well-trained therapist look like? A well-trained therapist is an expert at listening. He or she wants to hear how you feel, how you feel, not how you are supposed to feel. I know that might sound small. I'm going to pause right here and just add commentary to this, but that's really important. And again, you can extrapolate this 
to all of your relationships, your, your, your children, your, your partner, your friends, the therapist, the adequate, the, the, the good enough therapist is an expert at listening and they're interested in what you feel, not what you're supposed to feel. He or she will try to find you where you are. He or she will try to find out how it feels to be you with your history, your dilemma, your dilemmas, your hopes and fears. If instead of trying to hear and find you, your therapist has the right answer for you, find another therapist. The right answer will be the therapist's answer and not your answer. This will likely duplicate the ways you were treated by your parents. I'm not going to go into too much therapy theory tonight. I think that can be distracting and, and probably for, for another broadcast. But I want to talk about the idea of countertransference, which is the feelings. I'm going to, I'm going to boil it down to something quite simple. Countertransference are, are the feelings, the energy that the, ha that the therapist has toward the client. And if the client wants to fix you or teach you what's right, in most cases, that's going to be a repetition of the wound that you experienced in childhood. Because we adults have this tragic flaw of assuming that we know what's best for everybody else and we want to tell them what that is. We do it with our children. And we get confused because we know that boundaries are an important part of this work. We, we know that. I know that. You know that. And we, can, we get confused because we think boundaries are, are an expression of what's right for the other person when they're not. Boundaries are what's right for me, what, what I need, taking care of me. How you re respond to them, how you react to them becomes yours. It, it is your right to feel, think, and react to my boundaries, my stated boundaries in whichever way pleases you, whichever way makes you happy. In many ways, a good therapist is like the parent you did not have, and the psychotherapy is like the child you did not have. This is from Doing Psychotherapy by J.D. Gill. There's, there's sometimes the idea that you can substitute podcast listening, that you can substitute um, reading a book, listening to lectures for, for psychotherapy. There, there are a lot of things that can be therapeutic. And, and I do read books and I do listen to podcasts in addition to the work that I do in therapy. But I want to be very clear about this one thing. The kind of therapy that I'm talking about is an opportunity to repair an old wound. It's a reparative experience. So sitting across from another human being is an opportunity to counteract the messages, which are mostly not conscious messages, to counteract the messages from our childhood. So when you're sitting across from what, what I will use the phrase, an empathic other, an empathic person, a, a non-judgmental, patient, listening, curious, curious person who's interested in, in reflecting back to you who you are. When you have that experience of sitting across from that non-judgmental person, you counteract the opposite energy that's been internalized by you over the years, that there was a right way to think and feel. I'll talk about this a couple of times tonight. One of my favorite lead-ins to, to something that a client will share from me is when they say, I know I shouldn't think this. I know this is the wrong thing to say or to think or to feel, but I know that I'm going to get something risky, something vulnerable, something honest. And if I can listen and hold it and understand it and reflect back that, that compassion to the client, they can unravel it themselves and work it out in whichever way they need to. So psychotherapy is an opportunity to repair an experience, to have a new kind of relationships. I know a lot of the things that I say on a lot of podcasts probably, and especially this one, are going to sound like I'm overstating things, but I can't overstate this idea that the therapist responds, reacts, interacts with you in a different, a fundamentally different way than, than the way that your parents and other authority figures in your life have responded. And that's the counteract. That's the repair. Like a famous uh, self-help writer once wrote, we are injured in our relationships and therefore we heal in relationships. You can't do that with an object, with a thing. Some people can do this with 
with meditation. I've heard people talk about it. That's not my experience of meditation. My, my belief is that you have to have some experience. Jessica Benjamin, a, a very prolific writer in attachment theory, explained that the root of the self, who we are, is found through another person. When we have that experience of being seen, of being seen and of being heard, we have that, that feeling of, oh, yes, there I am. One of the things I'm, I'm very surprised at in, in discussions today about modern psychotherapy and psychology, there are so many models that focus on how to reduce your symptoms. And, and understandably so. People are suffering under the weight of their symptoms, their anxieties and their, their neuroses, their self-medicating behaviors, their, their self-sabotaging behaviors. All of that seems to be very pressing. But this kind of therapy that I'm describing goes above and beyond and beneath all of that. You can ask your therapist for techniques. I've had clients ask me if I do uh, EMDR or brain spotting, which I don't do e either one of, and say, you know, that might be helpful for you. Some people talk about dance as therapy or, or music as therapy or recreation as therapy. All of those things can be helpful. But I'm talking about the idea of sitting across from somebody who can just see you. For, for those that are new to my broadcast, those that aren't, we'll be able to probably predict what I'm about to say when I talk about the most famous master therapist I've ever seen. If you want an example of a master therapist, go back and watch Fred Rogers. Mr. Rogers. He was an expert at seeing and hearing children's feelings and normalizing it for them. See, mental illness, in essence, is when our feelings about who we really are get blocked for some reason, most often because they're found to be unacceptable or threatening. In the case of the parent-child relationship, if I'm angry at you, you have to do some, and you're my parent, you have to do some kind of work around allowing me to be angry with you, allowing yourself to be, quote unquote, the bad one. I wrote this yesterday on, on social media. If you want to look for a friend or a partner, a romantic partner, the number one advice that I could give somebody is look for somebody who's willing to be human, to be bad, to be wrong, to make mistakes, to be fallible. If you, if you find somebody who's not willing to do those things with, with some kind of ease, not, effortless, not effortlessly, but they're able to do that on a, on a routine basis, if, if you find somebody who's not able or willing to do that, you will then have to carry around both of your traumas. You'll have to carry around both of your, your, your sets of baggage, so to speak. Jamie writes in, and in, in, Jamie is her, her, her name. J.D. Gill is her, her pen name. Jamie writes in, in this new book, safety is not the precursor to tra treatment. Safety is the treatment. Sometimes it's really hard to tell therapists and, and field guides and staff at our intensives, do less. Let there be space. Yes, obviously there are opportunities to teach and to offer skills and tools. That's a part of it also. I, I'm not erasing that. But if that comes from a need for you to be a good therapist or to be helpful, that's your ego's need, not the client's need. But because the client grew up in a family with parents, they're likely unconsciously feeling the pressure to make you feel good. And they don't have experience with telling authority figures when they're upset or angry at them because it hasn't gone well for them. That's why the most important, the magical moment in psychotherapy is when you do get something from your therapist that you don't like. When you are upset, hurt, angry, frustrated with, with something that they're offering you in, in your therapy, and you say to them, I didn't like that. I don't agree with that. I don't want that. That hurt. That's frustrating. That's the moment when they have the opportunity to be different and to say, thank you for telling me. I'm so honored that you would tell me that. Now, what do most therapists do who aren't trained, trained in this process? They will politely, although I think that that's a misnomer, they will gently 
and that also might be a misnomer, misnomer, but they will professionally and, and academically explain how you're wrong, how you misunderstood their intent. In other words, this is going to sound crazy. They will gaslight you the same way that a narcissist will. They will make the problem yours because they can't carry it. And they will justify it the same way that a narcissist does by being right. When a therapist says or does something that a client isn't ready for in session, in, in the work of therapy, it's the therapist's mistake. I was teaching my daughter this some years ago. She was going through her coursework and her PhD, and she said, Dad, not only did I learn in my classes, and she learned about the kind of therapy that I'm talking about, not only did I learn, she said, that to make an interpretation or an intervention or a suggestion or a reflection that the client disagrees with, not only is it the wrong timing, but in essence, it's the wrong interpretation. So therapists are able to carry their, their own horrible, rotten self, adequate therapists. They don't need to be right. They don't need to be the expert or on top or win in this process. I'm going to say another thing that will sound like I'm exaggerating. The reason why we struggle in our relationships in life to find healthy relationships in, in my experience is we have so little experience with them. I mentioned Fred Rogers earlier when I was a young child and that's when Fred Rogers was on the air. I thought he was the weirdest person in the world. I felt kind of icky around him. I felt like he was condescending, patronizing, ridiculous. Maybe my age didn't quite match up with the audience. Now I look back and I realize he was a magician, a genius. I remember reading something in an article a few years ago. Somebody was attributing a, a quote or an idea to Fred Rogers about a child's anger and how you could help the child to kind of move through it and let it go. And the commentary was, that's not a real story about Mr. Rogers. He would not have done that. When, when children came scared or upset or sad, go back and watch. He didn't try to get them to get through it. He allowed them to feel it. He validated and normal, normalized it. He told exa shared examples and stories where he felt similarly. And, and by so doing, the child was, the children were able to feel it. And subsequently, they were able to move through it because we can move through feelings that we're allowed to feel. J.D. Gill wrote in, in a book called The Met Mexico Papers, there's a three-volume series. And in one of them, she wrote, both cruel people and inadequate therapists are famous for a desire to destroy defenses without considering the consequences. She describes, she described to me in therapy one time that the, her supervisor, a professor, challenged her and a group of therapists because they were tearing away the crutches from the clients. And the therapist, the, the, the professor made a big point of how you must, you student, you interns must be very proud of the closet you, you have full of your client's crutches. And, and, and Dr. Fox went on to explain, we don't take away crutches from our clients. They have them because they need them. But again, we look at them, we observe them. We, we, the same way that the Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh would say, listen to your anxiety and your depression like you would a crying child and say to it, here, I am here for you. It's that kind of energy. I want, to be, I want to take a pause and just say, and there are moments in session when a therapist can challenge you, can offer a new idea. And sometimes there's a, there's a uh, mistake in the therapist's orientation that they say something that you're not ready or able to hear. And that's when you have the opportunity to tell them how you felt. But it's okay it's okay to, to challenge at times if the client is ready to hear it, if it fits for them. When I challenge a client, I'll usually check in with them multiple times. Like, I'm going to push back a little bit. I'm going to challenge a little bit. Tell me how that feels. Did I overstep? Am I saying too much? 
does this sound too harsh? And at any point, if the, if the client pushes back and says, yeah, that doesn't fit, that's not right, then I drop it. I apologize for my misunderstanding or miscalculation. Remember this, this is important. When a therapist offers an idea, a suggestion, an, a, an interpretation to a client that the client is not ready to hear, the client will have the experience invariably of the therapist doesn't get it. They don't understand me. That's what a client experiences when a therapist offers an idea that the client's not ready to hear. The experience of they don't get it. They don't understand me, which by the way, is the exact same feeling that a client has when the therapist doesn't understand them. So you don't know which it is as a therapist. You don't know. You just have to trust the client that I might be wrong. They might not be ready, but we're going to, we're going to, we're going to walk around this for a little while longer. We're going to spend some time. I'm going to re re-engage in my listening practice and, and see if I can hear something different. So what are some characteristics, some behaviors to look for in a therapist? I, I wrote, first of all, look for a therapist who looks for you, who's interested in understanding you, who's listening. I love it when a client will talk for 40 minutes without interruption because I can hear so much in that. I can listen to what, it, what it's like in their life. I don't know if I share this with this audience. Maybe I did during my, my July break that I took this year, I had this nostalgic moment. I was back in orange County, California, where I'm from. And, um, I was up, I was up one night by myself. All the kids had gone to bed. We were at a, we were on a beach vacation. And I thought about my, I saw maybe something on Facebook with my elementary school principal. And I thought about my elementary school therapist that I got sent to once or twice when I was acting out in class. And somewhere, I think it was the fourth grade, fourth or fifth grade, I got sent to this, this counselor. I didn't even know his, I don't remember his name. I vaguely remember what he looked like. And as he was talking to me, I said at one point uh, that I was angry or upset. And he said that he knew how I felt. And I looked up at him and I said, you don't know how, how I feel. You don't know, know, know what it's like to wake up in the morning and be me with my mother, with my father gone, with the money issues that we have, with my brothers? How could you possibly know what, what it's like to be me when, when you say that? And he it was gentle and quiet for a moment. He said, you're right, I don't know what it's like to be you. I think what I mean is I know what angry anger feels like or sadness or hurt or whatever the exact emotion was that I was expressing. So I asked my, my, my elementary school principal over Facebook, what was the name of that therapist? Are you in contact with him? Is there any way I could reach him? Come, come to find out they're, they're still good friends to this day. And he gave me his address and I wrote him a, a, a heartfelt when I was writing it, a very tearful message, thanking him for that interaction and, and telling him at nine or 10 years old, I've kept that with me my entire life. The idea that I, I don't know what it's like to be you. I don't know what it's like to be a single mother. I don't know what it's like to be a woman or a mother for that matter. And all of your specific circumstances, but I do know what sadness feels like and hurt and loneliness and anger and joy and happiness feel like. And I shared this with him in an email. A couple of days later, he wrote back and he said he remembered that interaction very vividly. And he said it changed him. And for the rest of his career, he was very clear to state to people that he understood their feelings, not their exact circumstances. Small human interactions like that. That was 45 years ago. And the therapist and I remember that moment. I'd only seen him maybe twice in my life. And that moment made a difference. Look for a therapist who looks for you, who's most passionate and interested in understanding what it looks like to look at the world from, from your eyes, out from your eyes. They, they listen to understand, not diagnose. See, diagnoses are just, I've written, I've talked about this in other broadcasts. 
it's just a, a label that we give to a, to a pattern of behaviors that someone tends to display when they're feeling threatened or scared or upset or sad. Each person has a go-to or, or, or a set of go-to behaviors when they're feeling unhappy, unwell, safe, excuse me, unsafe, sad, scared, frustrated, angry. If those develop into a consistent enough pattern, we have names for those. That They are diagnoses. But that's not the person. That's just a label for the patterns that they tend to exhibit in their life when they're feeling a great deal of stress. So therapists who do the kind of work that I'm talking about, attachment-based psychodynamic work, they don't really get too concerned with diagnoses. When I had two parents years ago on separate phone calls explaining how toxic the other one was, the second parent in, in my phone calls, I was talking to them one-on-one, -on -one, the second parent said, can you see my partner's issues? Can you see their, their narcissism or whatever the diagnosis was that they were accusing their, their ex spouse, their co-parent of. And I said, well, I don't really think in those terms. I see the wounds. I see some of the trauma and I see how they tend to protect themselves just like I do you, just like I do me. And that's what I see. If you, the client get upset with the therapist, they don't make you the problem. I've described that already. I would say for the first 15 years of my career, that's what I was prone to do. And most every therapist, when I teach this stuff, when I write about this stuff, uh, I have lots of therapists agree with me. Oh, this sounds fantastic. It's trauma informed. It understands complex trauma and developmental psychology on and on and on. But it's very difficult for them to practice this behavior of allowing themselves to be wrong. If I've said something to you that feels hurtful or dismissive, you get to tell me. And I have grown up enough. I have done enough of my own healing that I can sit with it and I don't have to put it back on you. And I have heard stories from, from clients over the years about how their therapists have failed to do this. I've said many times, the best way to test if you have a new therapist, uh, if you have a therapist, excuse me, an adequate therapist, that's what I call a good therapist. If you have a, if you want to find out if you, if you have an adequate therapist, tell them genuinely about something you don't like that they're doing. And if they apologize and recognize the sacredness, I think that's how strong it is. The sacredness of your vulnerable, vulnerable expression of feelings toward them the, the, the unquestioned authority figure in the room, then you have an adequate one. If they try to explain to you their, their theoretical orientation and reasoning for why they said what they said and how you've misinterpreted it because of your distorted thinking or your misunderstanding, you have a therapist that can't carry their inadequacies. They want you to carry them. Subsequently, they apologize when they make a mistake or hurt you. And I would add, they will express a, a sense of honor when you challenge them. They're not anxious to fix you. That's something that I work on every day as a therapist and a father and a partner. It, it is something that every human being that I know, my therapist, and I consider her the master therapist. She's been in practice for 30 years longer than I have, give or take. And she still will stumble over this, this anxiety to fix people at times. And oftentimes she'll come back to the next session saying, Hey, I'm sorry. And I might not even notice the energy or I will say to her, it feels like you're trying to fix me. It feels like you think that I'm doing it the wrong way and that there's a right way to do it. I'll express some version of that. About a year ago, I had one of those experiences with her. And, and after all of these years, 20 three years of therapy with her. I was afraid to tell her, but I told her I was afraid. And then I told her what I was hurt or upset about. And she thanked me again and she owned it absolutely without, without any defense. And then we started to explore why I, why I was still reluctant to tell her. And I said to her, I think it's because you, you taught me all of this and I was afraid. What if you failed? 
you know, what if you couldn't do it? What if I had built you up to be this person who could essentially be an adequate therapist and be there for me? And it wasn't true anymore. They're able to laugh at themselves. I've said this before. You want to see somebody who's enlightened? Listen for people that are playfully self-deprecating. You know, it's interesting when, when, when I hear clients ask therapists that they're considering for, for long-term therapy, do you go to therapy? Have you done your work? I often hear these very clever responses that the clients tell me these clever responses that the therapists give back, like, um, well, that's why do you want to know that? Or, um, what, what would make the, what would be different if I did, or if I didn't all these clever ways to avoid it. I suppose when I get asked if I've done my work, I'd say, of course. Of course, I have gone to a lot of therapy or still go to therapy or I, I do my own work. Because I'm not putting myself out here as the expert in the paragon of health. I'm just putting myself out here as somebody who's a little farther along the path and, and then maybe others. And I can help those that are a little bit, little bit farther behind me on the path. But when somebody assumes that I'm thinking that I got it all figured out, I'll, I'll tell them vague or specific examples where I'm still struggling with all these issues. One time I was talking to a therapist, to a client, and they said to me, well, you know, you're, you're not afraid. You're, you're absolutely bold and courageous. And I said, I don't know where you got that idea. I don't know where I've communicated that, that to you. I'm very, very sorry if I have, but let me correct you and say, absolutely not. I'm still scared. I still struggle with guilt. I still struggle with trying to be right and good. You know, everything I'm, in fact, everything I'm telling you about tonight, I, I have made these mistakes ad nauseum. And some I still stumble with. They're able to laugh at themselves and stop, talk about themselves in playful, self-deprecating way. I got, I've been challenged on this next bullet point a couple of times, but this is what I wrote. The therapist's, you look for a therapist that doesn't need to be a good therapist and doesn't need you to think that they're a good therapist. There should probably be quotes around the word good. Cause what I mean by that is they don't need to defend themselves. If you accuse them of making a mistake, you see, that's just like in parenting or, or partnering. If I accuse you of something by telling you that I'm hurt or angry at you and you can't be quote unquote bad, you've got to defend it. You've got to tell me how you were good or well-intended. But if you don't need to be the good one, if you've accepted more or less your wholeness, as Jung said, Carl Jung said, I would rather be whole than good. If you've come to terms with your own humanity and fallibility, if you've learned in some part to love your horrible, rotten self, then you can take it on. As one enlightened guru once said, if somebody tells you something's wrong with them, you say back to them, it's, it's a shame that you've only mentioned this one thing because if you really knew me, you would have a whole lot more to talk about. And when you admit fault, he went on to explain, nobody can use it against you. See, this is about being human. So all these techniques out there that describe how to get rid of simple, even trauma, which is not simple, are, are missing the point that this is about becoming a human. In fact, Jamie Gill's, one of her earliest books is called Finding Human. In this same way. I've been, I just, I've just finished reading The Odyssey and, and please don't be impressed if you're inclined to be impressed by it because I should have studied in college and my, my 20 year old son, after a discussion, encouraged me to do it. And one of the things that he taught me as he's, as I went through it, as he said, in most of the Greek, Greek myths, the great tragic flaw of each of the characters is pride. Now they didn't have words. He didn't go on to explain this, but you see back then they didn't have words that had the same nuance that we have today uh, around issues that are psychological. So they couldn't talk about a defense or a narcissistic wound the way that we could. In fact, we actually borrowed from some of the stories to come up with some of these terms like narcissism. But the tragic flaw of the Greek heroes was pride. In other words, arrogance, self-delusion, not knowing themselves, not being okay with their, their humanness. 
their horrible rotten self. And so the wisdom that echoes through eons of time from the Greeks to today is know thyself. And to know thyself, we have to do battle with shame and guilt. And to have some success with that battle with shame and guilt, we have to sit with somebody who can see us. We can present to them something that we were told or taught over and over again in our background, in our religious contexts, in the context that we grew up in. We, we present something to the therapist that we've been told is bad and un unacceptable and wrong. And they look at it and they say, okay, yeah, that's how you are sometimes. A lot of us are like that a lot of the times. And with that shift in energy, the client can then start to see themselves because there's no threat anymore. It's not about living up to somebody's expectations or worrying about judgment. And I know that's terrifying to a lot of people because most of us live by judgment and we're afraid that if that gets taken away, things will get absolutely crazy, which by the way, they do just a little bit for a little while when you go through this process. But on the other side of it, frankly, is enlightenment. And all enlightenment is, is seeing and being present with what is. I believe that a, a therapist in this way doesn't graduate the client. The reason that this is, this is, I wrote about this, there's an article in Psychology Today that I published on this topic about graduating clients, initiating, graduating, or terminating clients because they've succeeded. Most therapists don't know how to be with a client when there's no crisis. They don't know how to sit and talk to you when all you have to talk about this week is the movies you saw or some interesting things that happened at work or, or the successes you experienced this week. And because most therapists don't know how to sit with you in, in that place and they start to feel inadequate because they're not doing anything because they have some baggage they haven't worked out from their childhood, they will tend to graduate and terminate you. So again, they're taking their feeling of inadequacy that they can't tolerate and they're making you carry it. And I can tell you, I've had many clients tell me that they've been graduated by their therapist with the kindest of congratulations for their success, but walked away feeling rejected and inadequate. And the reason they're feeling that way is because the therapist unconsciously, unconsciously gave it to them. So the therapist is comfortable being with you when there's no crisis or no presenting problem to solve that week. See, because the therapist doesn't have the agenda in this kind of therapy. They take your agenda and they work with it the best they can. If it's outside of the scope of what they can do, like if somebody asks me, do you practice EMDR or dialectical behavioral therapy? My answer is no, I, I, I don't practice that. If you want that, you're going to have to go to somebody else. But what I can do is what Jung said, I can learn about the theories and the techniques that are out there, but in the end, I'm going to be just a human soul sitting with another human soul and with often their unsolvable problems, like, like grief. An adequate therapist is flexible. And they don't, they're not rigid. I mean, a lot of therapists, especially young therapists, get very pious about their boundaries. And there's a shameful tone to it at times when they talk to the client about it. So when the therapist hides behind boundaries as an excuse for rigidity, that's a sign to move on. You're allowed to call me and I have to decide if I'm going to pick up. You're allowed to email me and ask me a question and I have the right to self-care to pick up or not. And I'm not going to give you a speech about boundaries and how I am right. Like I said, they're interested in understanding and not diagnosing you. They're patient. There's no rush. There's no urgency. There's no anxiety or angst to move it forward. I'm just going to pause here and say, this takes a long time. And when I say this, I mean psychotherapy and the, the, the practice of psychotherapy. It takes a long time. 
to learn. It's not easy. No weekend course or certification in a specific approach over a six week process is going to do it. You've got to get into your own muck. You got to know what that feels like. Like Carl Jung said, you, you've got to have experience with your own darkness to understand the darkness of others. An adequate therapist apologizes and is humble. As my daughter would tell all of you, she said to me one day on the way home from an intensive, she said, Dad, you, you are actually pretty humble at work. But you're not at home. Just in case you were thinking you were, she said, you're not at home. I wanted to argue with her, but arguing with her, with her would have proved her point even more. It took me a long time to be able to be wrong in therapy, to not need to be right, to not need to be on top, and to recognize the magic moment. By the way, this applies to your children in wilderness therapy. When I'm sitting across from a 16-year-old young person, and they're telling me what they don't like about what I've done, it's really important that I take the moment, especially early on in therapy, to listen. When I hear a client saying something like, I know this is justifying, I know this is rationalizing, I know I have my part in it, and I hear clients of all ages leading up to something with those quali qualifications, right? Qualifying what they're about to say. I know they haven't had a good experience with telling the truth in psychotherapy if they've had any psychotherapy. And if they haven't had any psychotherapy, I know they haven't had good experiences at home telling the truth about what they feel without being shown how they were wrong. A therapist, the way I'm describing, will meet you where you're at. They don't need you to trust the process. They, they let you come with their distrust. Your anger, your frustration, your hopelessness, your skepticism. I love it when clients come with skepticism because I know what to do with that. Just meet them there and assume. See how important this is? If I want you to, to, to trust the process, that's just so it's easy for me. But if you come with your skepticism and I recognize that, what I reflect back to you is you must have a good reason for feeling that way. Do you see the difference in that statement? You must have a good reason for feeling that way is the exact opposite, the antithesis of gaslighting, which is you're crazy for feeling that way. Can you hear that? That's why, and I wrote this in the Audacity to you. It's a funny example, but the, it's true. When my therapist said to me around 10 or 12, 14 years ago, if you came to therapy and told me you were having sex with a chicken, she said to me, I would assume you had a good reason and I would just want to understand why. Now, it was a funny example, but what she was saying was, I'm not going to be like the others. Even if you're doing something that everybody in the world thinks is irrational and, and misguided, you must have a good reason. And if I, can, if I can come to you with that kind of energy, do you see how that shifts your experience of shame and guilt? You see how that causes you to not need to hide anymore, at least in this session? One of my favorite moments is when I was working with a client where English was their second language. And he talked about how he was very, very, um, he spoke English very well. The accent was slight, but it was his second language. And he talked about how in, in some circumstances in business, he felt really insecure because he didn't have all uh, access to all the, the, the vocabulary. Of a, of a certain area or field or niche and how he would start to feel anxious and, and get sweaty and nervous and, 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 and start to, to misspeak a lot. And as he was describing this experience, I asked him, do you ever feel that way in session with, with me? Cause I hadn't heard it. I hadn't heard that or had that experience with him. And he said to me very simply, he said, no, 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 I, I've never had it in therapy with you because I, I can't get it wrong here. And I thought, that's what I wanted to feel like. You can't get it wrong here.
Find a therapist that's still learning, still reading, still studying, not because they have to get continuing education credits, but because it's their passion. How much self-disclosure? What I tell a therapist is just enough, not too much. It, it, you know, more self-disclosure is okay if the therapist is working on it in therapy. If you're not working on it in therapy on a regular basis, self-disclosure is dangerous because it's it's likely to be for you and the client can feel that. The client's going to feel that way anyway at times. You know, when I share a fallibility or, or, or a fault of mine or a struggle of mine, oftentimes clients will resort to trying to make me feel better because that's how they've been trained, right? That's what they've been exposed to. Like I described earlier, it's hard to find and recognize healthy relationships because we have so little experience with, with seeing them and being in them. So self-disclosure is something that you can do and use as a therapist when you're trying to model or teach. But if, if but there's any bit of it that's for you, don't do it. It's important that your preferences, your ideas, your agendas, your requests are not marginalized as your issue. The two stories that I give is a therapist. My therapist tells this story that a client came to her years ago and said, my, my parents think I need to be here. My fiance thinks I need to be here. And my therapist said to this gentleman, well, what do you think? What do you want? And the, the 30 year old or so client responded to the question by saying, I want to be a film director. And my therapist said, let's work on that then. Right? Because in that is all the wisdom that there is in life because it's about relationships and people and creativity and vulnerability and self-awareness and self-knowledge. It's, it's all there. So you meet the client where they're at. They want to talk about their child. You talk about the child. They want to talk about writing a letter to their ex-partner. You, you talk about that. It's not your agenda. I wrote this therapists encourage clients to, to use the phrase. I feel to talk about feelings, not because feelings are a conscious choice, but because feelings are ours. We ask to talk about feelings because they're, they're closer to the unconscious, right? They're, they're not quite the, the top of the conscious, the ego mind. We can follow them back and discover traumas and wounds and unhealed or undealt with business. And this next quote that I wrote is kind of the, the, the thesis of the first half of this broadcast tonight, which is new therapies, and many self-help books promise step-by-step -step simple instructions to the good life. But the fact is that this is hard. This is a hard lifelong daily project. Any other promise about therapy, in my opinion, is, is a lie. This is more than just psychology. I, I want to emphasize this. I wrote a paper on psychology versus therapy, which you can find, and I have the link here on the last slide to, to share with you. But psychology is understanding human behavior. Therapy is a way of being with somebody. You don't explain or, he, excuse me, you don't heal somebody's ACL injury by explaining the science of how a ligament is made. You do it through physical therapy and surgery. Sometimes medication is involved, right? You do something active with it. Equating psychology with psychotherapy is like thinking that explaining the science of how a tendon tears and repairs will fix it. Therapy is a verb. It's a way of being with somebody in a way that facilitates healing. Similar to the physical healing of a torn ACL ligament in your knee, there's no quick solution. There's no coming to a new level of consciousness without pain. People don't heal, like I mentioned earlier, simply by having their psychology, pathology, or neuroses explained to them. Just like the fact that people don't heal, heal an ACL tear by having it explained to them. Healing happens in safety. When we feel safe, we're able to explore our wounds without shame, guilt, or fear. Put another way, when we are accepted, 
we accept ourselves, then a deeper change occurs. I can't state it more plainly enough how important and clear it is. In fact, I want to share with you a quote that I found recently that I thought was one of the most profound quotes about safety that I've ever, I've ever read before. Somebody wrote, it's a, it's by a, a, a great Eastern thinker. He wrote the deepest feeling of compassion that does not seek to alter anything paradoxically alters everything. Again, the deepest feeling of a compassion that does not seek to alter any, anything paradoxically alters everything. It's what happened in Les Mis when the bishop gave the candlestick to Jean Valjean. It's what religious folks call grace. It's what the Buddhists call compassion. Now, a couple of questions, PhD or master's degree. To me, it doesn't matter. I mean, in a default, more the better, but I've known a lot of masters, master therapists, adequate therapists who have a master's degree. And I've known a lot of PhDs who are inadequate. I actually prefer more age and life experience, but again, I'll use my daughter for an example. She is an amazing therapist an adequate therapist because she knows what she doesn't know. It's fine to know the difference between a social worker, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, psychiatrist is an MD, a medical doctor, family therapist, mental health counselor, et cetera. Most of it's just about being with them in the way that I'm describing. Somebody who's done their work, somebody who's open, somebody who's humble. The, the, the master therapist prides themselves on what they don't know and what they don't say. What I find with young therapists is at the end of a good day of therapy, they're exhausted. Not because they were talking all day, but because they were listening all day. And they were holding at bay all of their old reactions and triggers that they've been trained and conditioned to have growing up and actually been taught to have in graduate school. This kind of psychotherapy that I'm talking about is not taught in most American graduate schools. In fact, most people in America and in Europe, in my experience and in Canada, most folks think that this kind of therapy is outdated because they have no experience with it. If you have experience with it, you know it, you know it in a way that you can't sometimes explain. When I have clients that have been in therapy for, for a long time, they will tell me, I have friends ask me about therapy and I have a hard time articulating what and how it works. I just tell them that works. I say as a consumer, you're allowed to ask difficult question and, and you deserve intelligent answers. You're allowed to ask for what you want. You're allowed to challenge their agenda and ask that your agenda be met. I think one thing that will help you again, doesn't have to happen, but helps a lot, especially when people come for like an intensive program at Evoke is just the idea that there may be something unconscious at play. Is there, or are there unconscious elements that are contributing to your dilemma? If you're open to the possibility that exists, that's wonderful. Don't have to have it, but it can be helpful. Asking the therapist, are they in therapy or, or do they get supervision? I use my therapist to this day for supervision. Almost every week I bring up a case or a question or an issue. Individual versus family therapy. I will tell you this and something I've become more acutely aware of even recently. Couples therapy and family therapy is for advanced is an advanced skill, both for the practitioner, but also for the client. For starters, I would encourage most of you to do individual therapy. If you're thinking about couples therapy or couples intensive, excuse me, or family therapy, I would strongly encourage you to consider doing an individual therapeutic experience first. Most therapists won't see more than one person in a family. I prefer it. I've been trained that way. 
I think it's more effective. And again, flexibility is one of the hallmarks of being a therapist. Master therapists, adequate therapists are, are reluctant to give directives and advice. They're, they're more interested in the process of you finding you. The master therapist, the adequate therapist knows that the outcome of therapy is that you find you. That you become your authentic self. And that's hard to dictate through assignments and directives. The master or adequate therapist doesn't pride themselves on calling you on your stuff. That is crutch stealing, as Dr. Fox, my therapist's trainer, calls it. They are empathic and understanding, and they recognize that when they get frustrated, angry, impatient, anxious, eager, annoyed, disapproving, shaming, labeling, that it's their problem, that they have lost contact. The simplest way that I write it is if you're getting frustrated with your cl client, you have in some ways lost contact with the client because if you understood them, you wouldn't be frustrated. And they take a what can I do for you stance. Here's a quote from my, my article on, on psychotherapy, excuse me, psychology versus therapy. Therapy has become problem solving rather than a process of the discovery of self. The discovery of self is not fostered by offering advice or answers, but rather by asking better questions. Gill, 2016, refers to this advice, this advice giving form of therapy as abuse. She wrote, the therapist or guide we choose must not duplicate the wounds of the past. Thus, if the therapist or guide knows what's, what is right for us and manipulates us to achieve these ends, excuse, excuse me, to achieve, achieve these treatment goals, it is abuse, plain and simple. And then she writes, it is hard to see how good abuse ever cures bad abuse. The experience, J.D. Gill goes on to write, the experience of seeing one's base from a different perspective can be profound. One way this happens is by allowing ourselves to be honest and open with someone who does not react the way our parents did. For example, what was quote, very bad unquote at home is now nothing. This difference in experience allows for the realization that things could be different. One's assigned position in one's past is not necessarily one's assigned position in the universe. And lastly, she writes this, Part of the business of psychotherapy is to discover and create al alternate experiences for thoughts, feelings, attitudes, and beliefs. This is undertaken in the service of freeing people to be able to re-experience themselves in a safe but different context. The virtue of talking to an empathic and accepting person who has a different base is that it quickly illuminates one's own. What was automatic and unconscious is noticed and discussed. The world is allowed to become one of noticeable constructions. In other words, we learn when we experience this kind of compassion that Gill is describing. We learn where we came from. We learn what we didn't have. The fish cannot discover water until it has, until it has experiences with not water. You can't experience shame and guilt and where it came from very easily until you experience not that. The therapist is looking to provide a container, a word that is a, kind of a funny word, but a space, a place, a conversation. They give authentic reactions. They are rational, honest, and authentic. They don't use fear to motivate. They're able to tolerate, accept the other as other. They provide a safe space. The expertise of the therapist is not in giving you the right answer, but in helping you giving you a space where you can discover the answer yourself. Healthy behavior feels foreign and wrong when it's first introduced. This is why suggesting that what to do is often resisted in therapy. Instead, we achieve, when we achieve a new level of consciousness, the healthier behavior comes from them. So sometimes when you propose an idea or a thought and the, the client isn't ready, you have to go back to find the authentic self or, or the wound or the shame or the guilt or the fear 
that is preventing the expression of that authentic self. You have to work with that. And then from that place, healthy behavior automatically comes out of it. Like I said, for psychotherapy to be most effective, the client must accept that there are some things, some drives, some wounds that lie beneath the surface in the unconscious. And they must be open to the discovery of those issues and how they are contributing to their life's dilemmas. I have a couple of, of, of links here for those of you that are watching either on the YouTube channel or live. Uh, a, a blog that I wrote, Climbing to the Top of the Mountain, Top Debunking the Myth of a th the Therapist group Guru. It's on my page, drbradreed.com, Looking for a Therapist Who Looks for You. Also on my blog page of my website, How to Discover the Real Self. Also on my blog. And then, like I said, the Psychology Versus Therapy article that was in the Journal of the Journal of, of Therapeutic Schools and Programs. You can just Google it there. Remember, it's not your job to train the therapist. You're allowed to be a, a conscious consumer. You're allowed to ask tough questions and you deserve respectful, intelligent answers. And especially with parents, you're more than just an object to change the child. I think one of the things that I work with with our therapists and work with therapists across the country is when you turn the parent into somebody that, that's in the way of you fixing the client, you're not seeing the, the, the parent as the child, the human that they are. So if you feel like you're being missed, talk to your parent coach, your parent therapist, even your child's therapist at Evoke about that experience. How you feel matters and ought not to be dismissed or marginalized as your issue. Not only is it okay to disagree with your therapist, but I think it's necessary for therapy to proceed. It's really easy to go to therapy, I know, and talk about everybody else in the world. But share with the therapist about how you feel about them, that's a real risk. And for me, it's the best way to discover whether or not you have an adequate therapist. All right, folks, I know we're over time. I don't have time to take questions. I'll save them for Thursday this week. The Journey of the Heroic Parent and the Audacity to Be You, which also talk about looking for therapy and therapists, are available. Both of my books are available on Amazon and Audible. The Audacity to Be You, more recently, was read by me. If you want to do a deep dive into your work, everything I've been talking about tonight is something we try to foster at our intensives program. Finding You is the next is the, is the individual intensive that I recommend for everybody to start with. September, uh, actually, that one is closed. October 5th through 9th is the next offering. November 11th through 13 online. If you want to come back and do a, a, an intensive, if you've already done a Finding You, returning to you October 12th through 16th is the next offering. I will actually be running that one. You can also contact intensives at evoketherapy.com to find out more information, ask questions. We have support groups for uh, current and alumni wilderness families. Um, September 1st at 6, at September 1st, excuse me, at 6.30 p.m. is our next offering. We have one meeting a month. It's just for alumni families. September 27th, 6.30 p.m. Mountain Time is that offering. And once a month, we have an alumni meeting for our intensives participants. September 13th is our next offering for that. Contact Malia at evoketherapy.com for more information. If you want an attachment-based coach, someone who's been, <coughs> excuse me, somebody who's been introduced and trained in this model, this attachment-based model, you can go to coaching at evoketherapy.com to be matched up with a therapist there, or you can go to our website and look at the coaching options there. We have pursuit trips that are three to 30 day wilderness adventure trips for families and young adults. Think therapy light or sober fun. Like I mentioned, we invite all current parents of our program to attend six of any of the 12 step programs that I've listed here, alanon.org, coda.org, familiesanonymous.org, adultchildren.org, or refugerecovery.org, or nami.org. Also offer classes and instruction and support in your area that are free. All of these broadcasts are available on Spotify or your favorite podcast app. Just search Finding You and Evoke Therapy Podcast. Or you can go to soundcloud.com or Evoke's YouTube channel and you can listen or watch there. Evoke Therapy Programs and me, Dr. Brad Reader, are on Twitter and Instagram. 
using the handles at Evoke Therapy and at Dr. Brad Reedy, respectively. You can also find our intensives program on Instagram using the handle at Evoke Therapy Intensives. On Facebook, you can find us by searching Evoke Therapy Programs or Evoke Therapy Intensives. And then we have a blog, a wonderful blog curated by Malia that you can go to on our website and find new content each week. If you want to contribute to, to our, our partners, um, if you want to give back to people who can't afford therapy and treatment, you can go to choosementalhealth.org or skyesthelimitfund.org or evokefamilyfoundation.org and see for opportunities to give back. My next broadcast will be this Thursday. In fact, these dates are wrong on the visual here. It'll be this Thursday at 6.30 p.m. I'll be doing a live Q&A for family and friends. You can invite family, friends, siblings to attend this. Any follow-up questions from, from here, anything you've submitted will be, uh, will be kept, and I'll, I'll answer those first. You can always write webinar at evoketherapy.com in between sessions, anytime to ask questions, make suggestions, give me feedback, uh, share a bit of your story. Happy to, to look at those. All right, folks, that's all for this evening. Thank you for on behalf of those that love you and those that you love. Thank you for being willing to do your work and show up to a broadcast like this. Have a great evening and I'll talk to you Thursday night at 6.30 p.m. Mountain Time. Take care. Bye-bye.